Cool. So I wanted to share a quick prototype of something that Ted pitched to me yesterday. I see Ted is in the midst of a deep conversation, but uh, Ted pitched to me using Dragon to validate kernel data structures because uh, apparently ext4 has a bunch of of a uh, kernel code that it has to validate that a bunch of ext ext4 specific stuff is uh, is sane. So I uh, we figured or he mentioned that maybe Dragon could do this. So I, I hacked something together that would work for that. So for those of you who aren't already familiar with with Dragon, here's like a quick um, quick introduction. Basically, uh, lets you look at kernel variables. So like, here's the initial file system structure. You can look at members in it. You can, uh, since last time I presented this, which was like 2019, you can do stack traces, and you can look at variables inside of stack, stack traces. So I'm cheating here, I looked at the source code earlier, but uh, epo weight has a max events thing, and you can just get the, the local variable out of it, and then like do stuff with it. Um, but like I said, what, what Ted pitched to me was using Dragon to validate data structures. So I wrote a ugly little kernel module that does some artificial bugs. Uh, first one is linked list. That, or I'm pretending here that two, li uh, two list ads raced to add uh, their own entries to the linked list. Uh, so you end up with a linked list that doesn't make sense. The next and previous pointers aren't consistent with each other. Then I have another example here where um, I have a red black tree, should be sorted on this key field, um, have like the classic red black tree boilerplate, and then have code here that set the key without deleting and reinserting it in the red black tree. So have some dragon code, which is based off of the, the dragon helpers that I, I already have that know how to walk through list, uh, linked lists and red black trees, but they do a little bit of extra validation on top of that. So it's, it's straightforward, what do you expect? Um, we get, when you're walking the list, you get the next field and the next previous field should be your current nodes thing. If not, just raise an error. For a red black tree, we can do a little bit fancier. Um, we check a few things. We check that the, the red black tree node's parent is the same thing as, the, as what you'd expect. And you can check that the ordering is all right. So, uh, does it compare it to what you think it should, uh, and whether your red black tree allows like two elements that compare equal or not? Um, so I stitch those up with a a thing that uh, will just print out if that fails. Same thing, have a key comparator thing here that kind of checks that that invariant, uh, and again just calls the validation thing. But both of the validation things also return to you. Uh, the actual items, so you can do further validation on them. So, I here's something that's that uh, does the that checks the VMAP areas, which are in both a linked list and a red black tree that are both sort should be in the same order. Uh, so it runs through both of those at the same time, checks them, and then also checks that the the start fields and end fields are uh, or that the start is before the end. Uh, so we can just run it. I don't remember if I already inserted this. I did not. Um, so that was the, the buggy kernel module. I can run Dragon. Since this is not installed, I have to tell it to where to find the kernel module to get the debugging symbols for it. And then uh, I can just run that script I just showed you. So it just tells you next field should have been this, but it's I got this instead. The red black tree is out of order, and the VMAP areas thankfully are correct on my prod kernel. So, <laughs> um, yeah, this is. Th I thought I really liked Ted's idea, so I just prototyped a very basic implementation of just two of the most common data structures. But be cool to see where else we can go with this. So um, I'll, I'll probably be adding uh, these two to the Dragon repo. If anyone has anyone else has ideas of what else you'd like to validate. Uh, the building blocks are really nice because we all have data structures built on top of these things, but they're sure to be like a Butterfest specific thing. Like we want to check that our our red black tree of like uh, range locks makes sense and stuff like that. So that that's all I had. Uh,
if you want to find out more about Dragon, you can literally Google Dragon Debugger, and I guess it's gotten SEO'd enough that it'll show up. Cool. Hey, everyone. Uh, so kind of ha uh, tacking on to what Omar was talking about here. Um, what right now uh, Dragon does is based on Dwarf, and it uses the Dwarf debug info, and if you're one of those lucky people who happens to have debug info packages installed on all your systems, that's wonderful for you. I'm so happy for, for you guys, but not everyone's that way, and sometimes you know, you've built a, a kernel and you already lost the debug info, it's stripped away. Um, but something that we happen to have right now uh, in the kernel is a few things, BTF, uh, and that includes function type definitions for all functions, uh, ones exported, ones that are not. Um, and per CPU variables as of now. KL sims, you, depending on your configuration, it has all exported symbols or more likely if you like stack traces then you have it for all symbols, not just the exported ones. And then we have other cool tools like ORC um, that can let you do a stack traversal without using frame pointers. Um, and those, those all on their own, sure they're not as powerful as the you know, the, the call frame information that Dwarf can give you, the, the source code mapping things that Dwarf can give you, but if you're just looking at a crashed system and you don't know anything and you don't know, you don't have the debug, un debug info, this could power a debugger. Um, and I don't need to rag on Dwarf. It's great if you have it. Um, so what would we need to do to use that? It turns out a couple things. So first we have uh, BTF, we'd need to add debug, uh, we'd need to add information for global variables. Right now, we don't have that for some reason, it's just per CPU variables, but it's like 2.5 megabytes of data. You don't, not every kernel wants to have that in loaded and not able to swap out. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a blocker for some people, but some people in a server might not mind using that 2.5 megabytes so that their VM core is always debuggable. Um, in the kernel side of things, you'd need a way for a debugger to be able to find KL sims. There are a few symbols that point you in the direction of KL sims, and then from there you can decompress it all and look at addresses, look at names and everything. And then last thing that you'd need is support in Dragon to be able to read BTF and do KL sims. And as it turns out, I've, I've done all three things in some very, very hacky fashion. Um, so just, just as a demo here, and I guess I should have this over here, um, we have, well first of all, this is a VM core, it's kind of small, and uh, yeah, 130 megabytes I'd say, and uh, if we just tried it with regular Dragon, uh, the same one that, that Omar was using, we wouldn't be able to look at these variables like, uh, let's see, init fs, yeah. It can't find anything because there's no dwarf information. But if we were to do the same thing with this custom thing that I've that I've got, I've got some stuff in there. And you know this little line, it was able to load KL sims and BTF data. So to be clear, there's no there's no not even on the file system is there a, a dwarf debug info for this program, but or for this VM core. But if we do it. Turns out we've got all of this data as almost as you'd expect. You know, how about the stack trace? Um, should tell it which PID, but there we go. We've got stack traces. Uh, these are using frame pointers, not the built-in ORC data, but it's all there. Um, and yeah, I just as an uh, as a final example, I think Omar had some good example right at the beginning and we can actually just paste this right in just to demo that all these features are pretty much working as expected. These are on this particular uh, kernel all the modules that we're running over with over 10 references. Um, that's really all I have. It's just a, a neat starting point to say that our kernels as at, almost as they are today have enough to power a small debugger you know live. We could do the same things live. Um, we could do these things on a VM core. So um, there's work going on. I'm starting to, to check this out on the BPF mailing list. So if you want, talk to me after. But yeah, that's what I have. Uh, just wanted to quickly go uh, through uh, how BPF uh, CI works. And this is a follow up to the talk that uh, 
Joseph did yesterday about how CI systems are useful for the maintainers. So uh, we are using Patchwork um, as a source of all the patches. Uh, basically, the way it is set up, every patch that is sent to BPF at VGER, it will appear on the NetDev BPF list. And um, so Patchwork will show status for each patch after we tested it. Um, it knows how to collapse patch series into one and how to identify it. And it can be enabled for any Linux subsystem. In fact, I know that it's already enabled for BetterFS and for many of them. So uh, this is the screenshot, the list of patches for BPF. And you can see the statuses. Some of them are passing with warnings. Some of them are failing. Uh, this is the example patch. Um, it shows that it is part of the series. And it shows the status of tests for this patch. And this is uh, like just a small amount of subsystems that already onboarded to the patchwork. Uh, we use uh, internally implemented kernel patches daemon. Uh, it's a Python service. It identifies new patches on the patchwork. Uh, it creates a pull request to the GitHub uh, kernel patches BPF repository. It merges GitHub actions on top of it, and GitHub will magically execute tests for us. And then uh, KPD takes results from the GitHub and posts it to the patchwork. So for example, uh, this is an example uh, pull request. Originally, uh, this patch series, it has four patches, but we also add GitHub actions on top of it as a separate commit. And um, this is a wrapper where a GitHub Actions is stored. And the, all the magic is in this uh, GitHub, dot GitHub directory. So everything that should be done is defined in there. It's just a script. Uh, so we have these two wrappers. And um, kernel patches BPF is just a mirror of uh, BPF and BPF.next uh, Git repositories uh, from the Linux kernel uh, Git. And uh, how we actually execute tests. So we have uh, self-hosted uh, GitHub runners. Uh, we currently support uh, two architectures. One is x86. We also support IBM S390X uh, to test different types of NDNS, right? Um, but if uh, your test support cross-compilation, you can run it on any platform that QM supports, basically. Um, so this is how runners look uh, from the GitHub perspective. Like, you, you can see that for x86, it's basically AWS instance uh, that we are spinning up to run all the tests. And uh, what tests we are running? We are running BPF self-tests. And this is how result looks for the successful run. This is how result looks for the failed run. And we also highlight uh, what was the issue with the tests. And yeah, we, we have pretty rich uh, roadmap uh, in front of us. So we want to add sanitizers. We want to add more platforms. Um, and we actually really want to onboard more uh, Linux subsystems to it. And some obvious things is like BetterFS, RCU, uh, that have some tests already available. We'll be happy if someone will want to contribute or to discuss it offline. Yeah. Thanks a lot, guys.